It may be the most addictive toy in history, and it's definitely the hottest thing this Christmas. Nintendo Video Games. In just four short years, we've witnessed the resurgence of an industry, and Nintendo's the leader of the past. Right. There's no question now that Nintendo has really taken off, and millions of fans are waiting for the next game. Our video game industry is hotter than ever this season, and one good reason, Nintendo has introduced some hot Japanese-owned Nintendo of America has emerged as the industry leader. Now what's Nintendo, you ask, and why should you care? Well, I think it's something you should know about. Switch sells up 30%, 3.91 one million as well. Nintendo's Q3 financials reveal that Wii U hardware sales are up. It's just a little over an hour before the launch of Nintendo's highly anticipated Wii. The latest video war, video game war is heating up tonight. Nintendo's GameCube system is about to hit the stores. <laughs> you know, it's not even Halloween yet, but millions of kids already know what they want for Christmas. A new video game system called Nintendo 64. Finally tonight, the latest video game craze to sweep the United States and Japan is called Nintendo. 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 A juggernaut within the gaming industry. Nintendo stands tall today as one of the largest companies in the gaming world, having many iconic and historical consoles, along with many beloved and acclaimed gaming franchises that have secured its place in history. Because of this, they are often hailed as the savior of the gaming industry following the 1983 video game crash. Nintendo's rise in the gaming industry parallels that of Disney's influence on the world of film. And while the company and its licenses just keep getting grander by the decade, many may find it hard to believe that this gaming giant once didn't even make video games. As the company started off making card games and toys, along with some other odd business ventures. Before dipping their feet into the gaming market, Nintendo was mainly focused on card games and toys. However, this would all change as in 1969, when Nintendo's president at the time, Hiroshi Yamauchi, chose to increase Nintendo's investment in a research and development department. This was to be directed by Hiroshi Imanishi, a longtime employee of the company, and to be joined by Gungpai Yokoi, a notable figure responsible for crafting some of Nintendo's most iconic products, was to be responsible for coordinating various projects within this research and development department. Yokoi's experience in manufacturing electronic devices led Yamauchi to put him in charge of the company's game department, and his products and his expertise in electronic devices led to his pivotal role in steering the company's foray into gaming. During this period, Nintendo distributed classic tabletop games such as Chess, Shogi, Go, and Mahjong, and other foreign games under the Nippon game brand. However, in 1970, Nintendo would make releases that would ultimately change its history, as it released Japan's first electronic toy, the Beam Gun, an optoelectric pistol designed by Masayuki Uemura. This Beam Gun would be just the beginning of Nintendo creating electronic forms of entertainment. In total, more than a million units were sold. The Beam Gun's success paved the way for collaborations like the partnership with Magnavox for their home video game console, the Magnavox Odyssey, in 1971, to provide a light gun controller based on the beam gun design for the Magnavox Odyssey. Other popular toys that furthered Nintendo's repertoire were the Ultra Hand, Ultra Machine, Ultra Scope, and the Love Tester, selling over 1.2 million units in Japan. The growing demand for Nintendo products led Yamauchi to further expand the offices for which he acquired the surrounding land and assigned the production of cards to the original Nintendo building. Meanwhile, Yokoi, Uemura, and new employees such as Genyo Takeda continued to develop innovative electronic products for the company. This led to the Laser Clay Shooting System, which was released in 1973. Though Nintendo's toys continued to gain popularity, a real-life event would bring this to a halt and would change the trajectory of the company. Good evening. 
The Middle East war produced developments all over the world today. The oil-producing countries of the Arab world decided to use their oil as a political weapon. In 1973, members of the Organization of Arab Petroleum Exporting Countries, led by King Faisal of Saudi Arabia, enacted an oil embargo targeted at nations that had supported Israel during the Yom Kippur War, and one of those nations happened to be Japan. The 1973 oil crisis would go on to cause both a spike in the cost of plastics and a change in consumer priorities that would put essential products over pastimes, and as a result, Nintendo lost several billion yen. And due to this loss, this would eventually change Nintendo's priorities for the company. However, even with this loss to Nintendo's wallet, they still went on to release Wild Gunman in 1974, a skeet shooting arcade simulation consisting of 16mm image projector with a sensor that detects a beam from the player's light gun. Both the laser clay shooting system and Wild Gunman were successfully exported to Europe and North America. However, due to slow production speeds and higher prices compared to the competition such as Bandai and Tomy, this ultimately led to the discontinuation of some light gun products resulting in the closure of Nintendo Leisure System Company. And while these unique electronic products would be discontinued, as the 1973 oil crisis made making toys too expensive to produce, Nintendo's president would be heavily inspired by another form of electronic entertainment, one that would go on to shape the future of Nintendo and millions of lives along with it. In 1978, the arcade classic Space Invaders was a huge success for the gaming company Taito. And with this success, along with the growth of the video game market overall, Nintendo's president had taken notice. Along with Space Invaders, Yamauchi would be motivated by the successes of video game company Atari and Magnavox with their video game consoles. Because of this, Nintendo went and acquired the Japanese distribution rights for the Magnavox Odyssey in 1974, and reached an agreement with Mitsubishi Electric to develop similar products, including the first microprocessor for a video game system. The home console market rose in popularity, particularly in North America with the release of Atari's Pong system in 1975. The market was flooded with similar video game tennis games as companies scrambled to cash in on its success, with Nintendo joining and jumping in on this craze, as Nintendo decided to make its own dedicated Pong console to import its popularity to Japan. This Pong console that Nintendo wished to release was to be produced jointly by Nintendo Research Development 2 and Mitsubishi Electronics. Now, Nintendo Nintendo had no prior experience manufacturing electronics and also video game consoles, and had previously contracted Mitsubishi for production on Ever Racer. So they again contracted Mitsubishi for this task on this console. For this console, and its sequel, Nintendo acquired a license from Magnavox Productions for its own Pong clone game console. They did this because Magnavox created the original concept for Pong for its Magnavox Odyssey console, which inspired Atari to create a similar game for the arcades. For this, Magnavox sued Atari and other Pong console manufacturers for copyright infringement. This would be the reason why Nintendo went and acquired the license, so they wouldn't have to deal with a complicated legal battle with Magnavox like Atari did. But that's a story for another day. Moving on, Nintendo's president, Hiroyoshi Yamauchi, specified that the consoles would be produced quickly and with cheaper parts to reduce production costs. He wanted a competitive edge by making the systems cheap for the consumers to purchase. The two game consoles required little production time due to their simplicity. Mitsubishi made minor changes and corrections to the systems before they were released. And with that, Nintendo's first console, or should I say consoles, were complete and ready for the masses. And these two consoles would be called the Color TV Game 6 and the Color TV Game 15. So how would they do? How would Nintendo's first dip into the video game console market feel? Would they take a nice relaxing plunge? Or would they feel the shock of a bitter cold dive? Hey everyone, just want to say thank you so much for watching up to this point. And this next part of the video is actually going to be narrated by a fellow YouTuber that I really enjoy and greatly respect, M. Swizzle. Now we have collaborated in the past and I really enjoy M. Swizzle's content and greatly respect him as a person. And I heavily suggest after watching this video, please go check out his channel. He makes great stuff. He does Nintendo and gaming podcasts overall and a bunch of YouTube shorts that I think you'll really enjoy. Really just overall a good gaming YouTube. So please go check him out and thank you, of course, M Swizzle, for being a part of this video. I greatly appreciate it. Now with that, please enjoy the narration from M Swizzle. Miru Telebi Kara Asobel Telebi. 
15種類ものゲームが楽しめるカラーテレビゲーム159800円のカラーテレビゲーム6もあります The Color TV game was launched on June 1st of 1977. It retailed at a price of 9,800 yen, which today is about 16,530 yen. Although that 9,800 yen price tag was significantly lower than the other competing systems at that time. And when Nintendo has an advantage over anybody, they will take it. So they went and used that as a marketing tool. In addition to that, they advertised that this console had six variations of Pong. No, Beer Pong was not one of them, but they did increase the amount of panels they d e c r e a s e the size of the panels, they even put deflective shields in the center of the screen. Now, to get power to your Pong, you can either use batteries and go full on wireless commando, or use the power adapter that we know today, which was actually sold separately. And in typical Nintendo fashion, shortly after the release of the Color TV Game 6, Nintendo released an improved version of the TV Game 6, featuring a cream white outer casing and removing the power adapter. They're forcing you to go no power adapter, full on commando now. You even have another version to promote instant noodles from a company named House Shenmen. It's identical to the original TV Game 6, but has the House Shenmen logo on the casing. Although this was produced in very limited quantities, making it an extremely rare collector's item to this day. Along with that, Nintendo had Sharp Electronics produce dark orange colored versions of the TV Game 6 to bundle with its television sets. Although, if you already blew the bag on June 1st for the colored TV Game 6, get your wallet back out, because one week later, Nintendo released. The Color TV Game 15. It retailed for 15,000 yen or 25,302 yen today, and it's roughly 50% more expensive than the TV Game 6's price. Essentially, the TV Game 15 is an enhanced version of the TV Game 6. It's like the Switch to the Switch OLED. Both consoles house the exact same 15 games, however, only 6 are accessible on the TV Game 6 without modification, hence the name TV Game 6. The TV Game 15 has detachable controllers which are stored in a small compartment on the system. In Following the TV Game 6's pattern, they released a second TV Game 15 with a reddish orange casing, which had a longer production run and are more common. Though, once again, Sharp was asked to make their own version of the console to bundle in with some televisions. They made a white colored version that was renamed the Color TV Game XG115. And thankfully for Nintendo, their efforts in creating a good quality and cost effective Pong console with good marketing paid off. As both consoles were estimated to have sold a million units each, making their first ever. Ever gaming consoles a success. Though commercially successful and thus providing the incentives to continue in this business direction, the release of the Color TV Game 6 and Color TV Game 15 was a modest first step into the video game market. Even though game ideas within these consoles did not originate from Nintendo themselves, Nintendo had successfully made their way into the video game console market, and thanks to these successes, they weren't done just yet, as they would soon release more Color TV consoles. The third unit, which was named the Color TV Game, Game Racing 112 was released exactly a year after the release of the Color TV Game 15. The Color TV Game 15 was June 8th of 1977, and one year later is June 8th of 1978 for the Color TV Game Racing 112. This new console was significantly larger than the previous two units, with a larger shipping box to accompany it. The Color TV Game Racing 112 was set to be released at 18,000 yen, but was lowered to 12,000 yen to ensure the Color TV product would remain competitive. Later down the line, it Received a cut down to 5,000 yen for the exact same reason competitiveness. Now, to prevent the machine from requiring a larger box, the wheel is detachable from the console. The built in game is a top down racer similar to Speed Race, an arcade game released by Taito in 1974. The variations include a smaller screen width and opponents that move faster, with all possible game combinations totaling to 112, hence the name. The console also comes with two paddle controllers for multiplayer support. Now, we move further down the line, because after that, Came the Color TV game Block Kazushi. I wish they still named consoles like this. I would like the Switch Kazushi, but this was released on April 23rd of 1979 at 13,500 yen. Now, the system was produced by Nintendo, allowing its name to be prominently displayed in all its glory. The built in games for the Block Kazushi in the previous Racing 112 console were designed by Takahiro Izushi. The Block Kazushi 
console includes six variations of Breakout, an arcade game released by Atari in 1976. This clone of Breakout by Nintendo was called Block Fever for Japanese arcades in 1978. However, this time Nintendo wouldn't be alone in the Japanese market, as rival company Epoch released their own TV block console in Japan. It was successful and gave way to steady competition with other companies and Nintendo. The system's casing was designed by a name you've probably heard before, Shigeru Miyamoto. This was one of his first video game projects after joining Nintendo in 1977. Although things are heating up, other companies are trying to get into the space, so to bring some hype to the console, Nintendo held competitions in department stores to promote the Block Kazushi console. Now the winners of said competitions won a congratulatory note and a medal. Geez, I wonder what those are worth now. And the final color game console, the computer TV game, was released in 1980. Because dedicated consoles were decreasing in popularity at this time, the computer TV game was only produced in limited quantities. When you hear limited quantities, you're probably thinking, oh snap, it's rare, I'm not getting one. And you would be right, it is extremely rare. Miyamoto was back on the job, and he designed the system's white colored casing and the packaging. And it's about time that Nintendo went from diapers to pants, because this console was produced internally at Nintendo, no longer needing anyone's help. The computer TV game contains a version of Computer Othello, which is a tabletop arcade game and is built around an original Computer Othello arcade system board. This makes it an arcade perfect rendition, an uncommon sight during the 1980s. And those are the first video game consoles that Nintendo released. Overall, the Color TV game series was very successful for Nintendo and was a commercial hit for the company. Nintendo sold 1 million units each of Color TV Game 6 and Color TV Game 15, along with half a million units each of Racing 112 and Block Kazushi were sold. And while these numbers seem pretty low compared to today's game sales, the Color TV game series actually had the highest sales figures of all the first generation of video game consoles. And with that, Nintendo now had the experience, the sales, and building blocks to make a much bigger splash in the ever-increasing video game industry. But with the success of the Color TV consoles, how would Nintendo choose to continue with them? Even with the success of these consoles, the entire Color TV game series was eventually discontinued by Nintendo. But while this was the end for the consoles, it was only the beginning for Nintendo, creating video game consoles and games. The success of the Color TV consoles prompted Nintendo to continue pursuing the video game console market, leading to the creation of the family computer and the Nintendo Entertainment System, the cartridge-based systems with a library of hundreds of games. And as a result, Nintendo sold millions of these consoles, the Famicom, and its Air National Council parts in the Nintendo Entertainment System, and it solidified the company's presence in the video game hardware market. And beyond that, Nintendo now has cemented itself as one of the most successful and loved gaming companies around the world. It all started here with these simple consoles. And just look at how far Nintendo has come from this first console, as within the top 20 highest sold consoles ever, they hold half of those with 10 consoles. And even today, their consoles are setting records as their most recent console, the Nintendo Switch, is the third highest selling console of all time. And in fact, they also hold the second highest selling video game console of all time. Nintendo has dominated the video game console field, and they haven't slowed down one bit. Looking back at it, it's just crazy to think that all started with these little consoles. Sure, they were simple and the games weren't of their creation, but they were a starting point for what would become one of gaming's biggest companies and contributors. Like so many creations, it always starts off small, often with mistakes. But like a tree, it takes time to grow and bloom. And that is exactly what happened with Nintendo's first gaming consoles. They create consoles, often with the help of other, more experienced companies, with games made by others, but they are able to create a cost-effective and quality product for the consumers. And from that knowledge and experience, they grew their brand and their experience, learning not only to create their own consoles, but eventually their own games as well. And in turn, their sapling soon grew into a huge, luscious tree that just got bigger and bigger. Going from a small, simple console to a console that has played hundreds of different games with better quality gameplay and graphics. And this upward trend would just continue with every console and release, with better graphics, better technology, better games, and in turn, more fun for the consumers. So when you turn on your Nintendo console of choice, whether that be the Switch, 3DS, Wii U, Wii, Game Boy, GameCube, whatever console you wish to indulge yourself in, just remember where it all came from where it started. It came from a company that was willing to enter a market they had little to no experience in, but was willing to learn and grow to create 
some of gaming's most beloved consoles and games. And it's all started here with the simple game of Pong. Hey everyone, thank you all so much for watching. I greatly appreciate and a big thank you again to fellow YouTuber, content creator, M Swizzle for being a part of this video. I greatly appreciate everyone. Please go check out his channel. If you haven't heard of him, I really think you're going to enjoy his content. But everyone, I just want to say thank you again for all of you joining us on this little walk through history on Nintendo's consoles. I greatly appreciate it. Please, if you like the video, leave a like and please let me know what you think of this topic in the comments below. I would love to hear what you guys think and please let me know if you'd like more of these shorter form documentaries. I like doing my long ones, but also these shorter ones are a lot of fun too. And if you do enjoy this video and look forward to future videos, please think about subscribing for updates on future content. But with that, everyone have a happy holidays and I'll see you in the next video.